Good morning. Good to be back. Good to be here with you guys this morning. I'm excited for a new year and to see how the Lord will continue to work in us corporately as a church and, and individually. And let me read a passage. I'm going to read a passage from Psalm 34 this morning and pray and we will worship the Lord together. Psalm 34, verses 17 to 22. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned pray together. Father, thank you that you are for us, not against us. You love your people. Lord, I know many of us are coming into 2022 broken and hurt and still confused, still feeling like we're in a time warp. Lord, I pray that in the midst of the brokenness, and the confusion, and the chaos, and the shame, Lord, we would look to you knowing that as you tell us, Jesus, in Matthew 11, you are gentle and lowly in spirit. Lord, you are kind and compassionate. You are for us and not against us. God, you are for your people. You, right here, as Psalm 34 reminds us, you are near to the brokenhearted and you save the crushed in spirit. Lord, you redeem the life of your servants and none of those who take refuge in you will be condemned. God, I pray that every one of us in here or everyone listening online would trust in you, would truly take refuge in you, knowing that you are good and kind and compassionate, and knowing that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Jesus, I pray that we would look to you this year, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I know on the uh, order of service we have that we're taking communion right now, but we're calling an audible. It's a new year, so might as well do a new thing, right? Uh, so we're going to take communion at the end of the sermon. So if you have uh, your juice and your bread, you can just hang on to that a little bit longer. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and then we will continue singing. Father, thank you again for this time that we can gather together. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace toward us. God, we know, like this being a new year, it's just a, a, a reminder of your mercies that are new every morning. God, it's a reminder that one day all the broken things will be fixed. All the wrong things will be made right. All the bad things will be vanquished and all the good things will come true. And Jesus, we know that you are working your will and your way and with your church, with your creation. God, though we don't always see it, though it seems like brokenness is rampant, God, we know that you are good and you are for us. God, we know your steadfast love, O oh Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds, as Psalm 36 reminds us. God, we know that your righteousness is like the mountains of God and your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O oh Lord. How precious is your steadfast love. O oh God, the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Lord, I pray that we would take refuge in you. God, that's just kind of the theme today. Lord, I pray that we would look to you. We would trust in you. We would find all of our hope and identity and fulfillment and joy and peace in you and you alone. Lord, I pray that we would see you for the redeeming, shelter that you are, for the redeemer that you are. Jesus, you are the great hero, the great rescuer that all of the Bible is pointing us to. The Lord, remind us of those things this morning. God, as we step into this new year, Lord, I pray that that would be our theme, that we would see that you are gentle and lowly, that you are loving and kind, that you are patient and good, that your love is steadfast. It never ends. It's enduring. God, you 
didn't send your son, Jesus. You didn't come to judge the world, as you reminded us in John 3, but to save it, to rescue it. Jesus, thank you that we get to be a part of that rescue mission. Lord, I pray that we would see ourselves as followers of you, Jesus, people who have been called to follow in the way of Christ, and therefore are called to point people to the rescuer and the redeemer of our souls, to invite people into the rest that we get to enjoy. Jesus, help us to sing out of hearts that are so filled with love and joy and peace and rest in you that that nothing can contain it. Lord, I pray as we continue to sing songs to you and about you, as we continue to study your word, as we here in a moment take communion together, that we would look to you and trust in you, the great shelter and rescuer and redeemer of our souls. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before before we dive into the sermon, uh, I want to do something a little different. I think I think this is good, just kind of the, the mode of this morning and uh, just even the songs we sang and the new year, right, a way to start off a new year. Um, I think it's real easy when we just come in uh, to a church service and do the same thing over and over and over again. It's, it's easy uh, to, to skip over why we're here, right, the, the grace of Christ, the mercy of Christ, the goodness of Christ towards us, his love, his compassion for us, his forgiveness, his grace, what he did on the cross. And, and we're going to remember that in a moment, right, as we take communion towards the end of the sermon, but I, I want to spend a few minutes, I know, I realize this leaves people online in an awkward spot, so feel free to join in with us, uh, but, but I want to just give a few moments of just silence, just to spend time praying on your own, or maybe praying with your spouse, or uh, kids, or whoever, uh, just, just praying together uh, that you would look to the goodness, and the gentleness, and the lowliness, and the grace, and the mercy of Christ this year. Thank him for his, his grace and his mercy. Like, I hope you, you sense that, you know that, you feel that. Uh, his goodness, his grace, the things we just sang about, the truths we just sang about are, are realities for you if you are in Christ. And so I want to just spend a few moments, uh, so I know it leaves kind of awkward silence, but spend some time praying together. It's what we're called to do, to remember Christ, to look to Christ, to pray with one another. So spend time praying on your own. And then I will pray, and then we will jump into God's word together. Father, thank you again, and I know we've already prayed this, and many of us have spent a few moments this morning praying, but you are truly good and kind towards us. Lord, you, you, Jesus, from you flows this fountain filled with blood that washes away our guilty stains, Lord, that we just sang about. Lord, we know none of us are here because of our righteousness, because of our goodness, because of our righteous acts. Lord, I pray if that is why we are here, you would cause us to fall in repentance to you. Knowing that that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were checking off lists. They were counting their attendance and their how much scripture they could memorize and how good they could be. Lord, forgive us if that is what the basis of our faith is. But Jesus, rather, let us be reminded that the basis of our faith is nothing that we have done. It's all accomplished by you. Jesus, the work you did on the cross. Your righteousness, your righteous life lived in our place. You lived the righteous life that we couldn't live, that none of us can. And you died the death that we deserved to die in our place, paying for the penalty of our sin with your blood. 
God, you, and Jesus, you conquered the grave three days later. You're alive forevermore. Jesus, you set a pattern for us. If we're in Christ, we will likewise be resurrected and be with you forever. Lord, we long for that day. And while we wait, Lord, I pray that these gatherings would not just be another time when we come here and check off a list and, and do our religious duty. But I pray that our time here would truly be spent gazing upon your goodness, gazing upon your glory, basking in the shadow of your wing, knowing that you are a shelter for us. You are gentle and lowly. You are kind. You are compassionate. You are good. And as we'll see here in a moment, as you were to Hagar, you are a God who sees us so full of mercy and grace. Let us be reminded of that truth once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17 together. I want to challenge us to make that a regular practice of this year. Not just here in the Sunday morning gatherings, we won't do that every week, but just a regular practice throughout your life, praying with one another, just simply focusing on the gospel. Right? We talk a lot about that here, the gospel. We talk a lot about preaching the gospel to ourselves. That's part of it, right? Just that meditation. We're not, and again, meditation isn't this weird, right? Just sitting there and zoning out. Meditation is truly chewing, mentally chewing on the words of God, uh, chewing on the goodness and the grace of, of God and, and thanking him for it. Reminding yourself of that. That's what it means to preach the gospel to yourself. So with that, let's go to Genesis 16. I may have said 17 earlier. Genesis 16 is where we will be. We're picking up our series again. We took a couple of small breaks there. I know so this has been cut off a couple of times, but we're going to continue uh, in this series. So hang with us. It's a long book. Genesis has 50 chapters. We've only gotten through chapter 15. Uh, so this series will probably take us through the summer sometime. We'll, of course, uh, eat up large chunks of this book as they really go together. There's what's called movements in this book and certain movements that are pointing us to Jesus. Re remember, we believe, I know it's New Year's, and so I'm reminding us, rehashing some things uh, that, that are good reminders for us. All of the Bible is pointing us to Christ, to Jesus, his finished work, including Genesis. So we're, we want to be reminded of that. Uh, before I begin, I just thought I'd share a, uh, a, a quote from you. Since Christmas is only 357 days away, I know so many of us are, are looking forward to that, right? It's coming right up. I thought I'd share a scene from the movie Santa Claus 2. Uh, did anyone spend time this Christmas season, be honest, watching the Santa Claus movie? Or am I the only one? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Rob and Brandon, thank you. Oh, Kara. All right. Uh, in this movie, right, Scott Calvin, Tim Allen, uh, he, he goes to his son's school and meets up. I won't rehash the whole scene, but he goes and meets up with his ex-wife and her now husband, Neil, who's a psychologist. By the way, it's kind of a, a, a hilarious uh, thing that goes on between the, the new husband that's a psychologist and the ex-husband who's Santa Claus. And the wife asks, the ex-wife asks, uh, how do you know, always know when there's a problem, right? Tim Allen just seems to show up. Santa, he's Santa Claus. He says, how do, she says, how do you always know when there's a problem? Tim Allen replies, I see you when you're sleeping, I know when you're awake, right? We all laugh, we know he's Santa Claus. And Neil, the psychologist, interjects, and he said this, this kind of funny phrase, uh, which stuck out to me, it never stuck out to me before until I was watching it for like the 34th time of this Christmas season with my kids, and, and he said, uh, which is a pretty frightening concept when you think about it, right? So the psychologist, of course, interjects that, he says, uh, he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, which is a pretty frightening concept when you think about it, and it got me thinking about particularly this passage uh, in Genesis 16, when, when we'll see Hagar in a moment, uh, begin to talk about how God sees us, all right? And so, uh, yeah, if there was, I know there's no kids in here, and I'm sorry if I ruin it for them and they watch it online later, but right, we know there's no such thing as Santa Claus. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, Don is shocked, but, uh, <laughs> so, but that would be a frightening concept if if some fat guy in a suit uh, who is not uh, all-powerful or completely good saw us all the time. That would be a frightening concept, a bad thing. But there is one who sees us all the time, uh, right? And, and we're going to 
see that here in a moment. And and so what I want us to begin thinking about is uh, God as an all-seeing, what we refer to in the theological world as omniscient, right? He's omniscient. He's always seeing. He's always knowing. Does that, uh, him being an all-seeing or omniscient being, comfort you or frighten you? And think about that, right? I know know we would jump to the conclusion of, if we're followers of Jesus, well, that comforts me, right? But, But does it? When we really begin to think that God sees every single thing we do, right? the good, the bad, the ugly, right? what we do uh, when we're by ourselves, what we do when no one else is around, uh, the conversations we have with our spouses, with our kids, uh, every other moment in between, God sees every single thing. And so when we really begin to think about that concept, uh, that should affect the way we live. And so we're going to see that here in this story. This, this story, um, right? again, you know this is, we believe this is true, but I'm calling it a story because it is one story that's leading to Christ that was really happened in history. The story happens sometime after God initially made his covenant with Abram in chapter 12. Remember this? We're going to kind of catch up on some context. God makes this covenant with Abram back in chapter 12 uh, that he would uh, have this offspring that would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. He brings that up in Genesis 15, and, and, and then from that offspring, there would be one who would be a blessing to all nations. Remember that? He says he will be a blessing to all nations. When we look at that in the context of Galatians, we know that that offspring is singular. It's talking about Jesus, that offspring. So, so the offspring to come from Abram would be Jesus, who would be the greater Israel. It wasn't just necessarily about Israel. It was about one person within Israel, Christ, who would be a blessing to all nations. That's an important concept to grasp. And then in Genesis 15, remember this is where we left off. Again, I'm just kind of getting our our contextual juices flowing. Uh, Genesis 15, God makes this covenant with Abram. You remember that? It's kind of this gross picture, but they slice all these animals in half and put one on either side, and they flow down into this ditch. And two people normally would walk through this ditch together, this ditch of blood, making a blood covenant. But God, in this picture, God does it alone in this vision he gives to Abram. Abram stands on the sideline, and God goes through it by himself, signaling, I'm going to keep my side of the covenant and your side of the covenant. And, and of course, we know Christ. That's ultimately pointing us to the new covenant, which Christ would seal with his blood on the cross. So that's where we we leave this. So Abram has had a lot of high moments up to this point. Minus one, remember when he lied to Pharaoh about his wife? So, so there's been some low points and some high points. Now we're going to start to see some really low points in his life. And we're going to see a couple of aspects in this passage. I know I'm, not, I'm doing a lot of contextual work, but that's important before we dive into this. We're going to see a couple of things, and this is what I want us to look for. Uh, one, we're going to see a negative aspect in this passage, and that is, the negative aspect is, the corporate effects of sin and the continual brokenness of mankind. We're going to see how sin affects more than just you. There are corporate effects, real corporate effects to sin, and that's important to grasp. That's the negative aspect of this passage in Genesis 16. The the positive aspect, and here's the one where we we will end on, is uh, that God's mercy, God's seeing mercy, despite our brokenness. God sees us, and he shows us mercy in that, despite our brokenness. And so let's not miss that. So with that, let's dive into this text. Genesis 16, starting in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Okay, this is bad news, right? If, if God has made a covenant with Abram um, that he was going to have children, and from his children would come these offspring that would be a blessing to all nations, or this offspring, rather. Um, And there's no children. That is bad news, especially given Abram's age. He's in his 80s at this point, particularly probably about 85, as we'll see here in a moment. The the end of the passage gives us his particular age when he has a son, but he's probably somewhere in his 80s at this moment. And, and, And if you took any kind of biology in school at any time, you know it is difficult for someone in their 80s to have a child, right? And his wife was not much younger either. And so, so this is an issue when it begins off. Here's the problem here. 
Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And then we, we are introduced to a new character. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah, Sarai. So a couple things I want to point out here. One, again, we, we have to rem- remind ourselves this promise is all about Jesus. This is pointing to Christ. In Jesus' lineage, there's a lot of brokenness here, right? And we're going to see some of that brokenness begin here. Uh, Sarai, though, before we get to Sarai's brokenness, she does make a one true statement that I want to point out. Sinner as she was, she was a great sinner, and we're, we'll see that here in a moment. She recognized God's sovereignty even over who, her womb. I want to point out something, this statement that Sarai makes in verse 2. She said, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. The Jewish people had a lot better of a concept of God's sovereignty than you and I do. Right? We tend to think of God's sovereignty as kind of being somewhere else, and then we are also completely sovereign beings. Right? We get to be autonomous. We get to do our own thing. Uh, and God kind of uh, offhandedly stands to the side and is not uh, interwoven in every aspect of our lives. Uh, that's not how the Jewish people saw God. If you read Scripture time and time again, they saw him as this completely sovereign being in every aspect of their lives, even over something like getting pregnant. And that's, that's an important concept to grasp, because if we are truly going to trust in a powerful God, we have to trust that he can use every part of our lives, even our brokenness and our sin, right? And, and Sarah makes this, this bold, grand statement that I think many of us are afraid to say um, because we don't want to blame things on God, as if God can do wrong, right? But all the things God does is right, even if that is preventing Sarai at this moment from bearing a child because he's sovereignly working in this will. Now, there's going to be sin involved, which is never on God's side, right? We have willfully sinned against God. And here, Abram is going to willfully sin, and Sarai and Hagar are going to willfully sin against God. And yet, even in that moment, God uses even our sinful moments for his purposes and plans. That's an important concept to grasp, right? Acts chapter 4 talks about that. God says, uh, or the, the, uh, the apostles pray, in the city were gathered your, uh, the Jewish people who killed your servant, our servant Jesus, your servant Jesus, they're talking to God, uh, right? They did the sinful act which you had predestined to happen before him, right? So God, we have to get this concept in our mind. God can somehow predestine something to happen even a sinful thing like killing the Son of God without being responsible for that sin, right? We don't have any kind of concept of that in our world. We don't have any kind of concept in and of ourselves of that in our brain, but the Bible gives us that picture. And so we have to kind of formulate uh, this, this section in our brain that thinks God is sovereign and works even in brokenness and sin, right? That's the, that's the picture that the Bible gives us. All right, that was kind of a bunny trail. That was for free this morning, but we'll continue on. But that, I think that's an important concept. Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Now is the not-so-good part of Sarai's statement. Look, what, look at this bright idea that she has. <clears throat> she says, go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Does this remind you of any kind of story we've already looked at in Genesis? Remember the serpent tempting Eve? And Eve said, hey, husband, eat this fruit. And the husband, rather than leading, followed in her, his wife's sin. Right? This pattern repeats itself throughout history over and over and over again. We refuse to, to listen to God's way and we choose our own way always walk into this sin. And we're going to see this time and time again. This is true of you and I. It's real easy to point fingers at Abram and Sarai. But this, this is what happens in our life over and over and over again. Verse 3, so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. 
and he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Verse 6. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. You see the, the pattern that repeats itself here? I mean, this is, this is Genesis chapter 3 all over again. Remember, Genesis chapter 3. Eve listens to the voice of the serpent. She takes of the fruit she eats, she gives to her husband, and then chaos and sin continues to ensue. This is the unraveling, right? This is the brokenness part. We're calling this series Beginning, Brokenness, and Blessing because we see the beginning of all things, but we see the beginning of brokenness too and the pattern that it sets. And this pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. Sin only spirals down to more brokenness, to more sin, to more chaos. There's never a good example of this kind of sexual ethic, by the way, in the Bible. Let's, let's talk about this here in a, for a little bit. Abram and Sarai are not the models for morality. I just want to get that off our chest, right? Like we talk about being an Abram uh, being, or an Abraham. He is definitely not our model for morality. If this guy was like one of the worst husbands ever. Can we just go ahead and admit that? And, and God still used him, by the way, because we're going to see a lot more brokenness in his lifetime. Uh, he did some really horrible things, and most of the people in the Bible are like that, by the way, outside of Christ, right? Like, like all, of, all of the Bible points us to a bunch of broken people who are rescued and redeemed by Jesus. And you and I come into, hopefully, come into this gathering as a bunch of broken people who are only rescued by Jesus. So let's not make a moral lesson out of this, because this isn't what this is meant to be. Rather, this is pointing us to Christ, Abram listened and took Hagar as his wife. So let's, again, look at, look at this. Abram and Sarai were broken. Sarai says, hey, I can't have kids for you, so why don't I give you my servant, and I'll give you her as one of your wives, and you can have a baby with her. And they do. Brilliant plan, right? What can go wrong? Right? This is a horrible idea. <laughs> but this, this, is, this idea of a sexual ethic is, is wrong, and the church rightly laments this. Let me, let me talk just a moment about the difference between description and prescription, by the way. The Bible is not prescribing this. You understand that, right? Like, I hear people talk about that often, like, well, polygamy's in the Bible. Yeah, it was. So it was murder. So it was rape. So it was incest. The Bible is not prescribing any of those things, right? So, so let me use an example. If I say... Um, if you smoke cigarettes, you may get lung cancer. It's a, it's a true statement, right? That is a description. I am not, if you go out of this place inferring from that, hey, Zach says we should go smoke cigarettes. Or Zach says we should go get lung cancer, right? That would be taking something I describe as a prescription, right? You guys see the difference there? And, and so the Bible does a lot of describing, and we tend to make it, into prescribing, right? We tend to say, hey, the Bible, these people in the Bible do this. Why don't we go and do this, right? This is, what, this is what cults and all kinds of different things have done throughout history. Hey, many people in the Bible had uh, multiple wives. Why don't we go and take multiple wives? It's, it's never a good idea. The Bible never gives us a good example of that. In fact, it always gives us negative examples of this kind of sexual ethic. So that's the difference between prescription and description. This is describing something not prescribing something. But, but this was normal practice during this time. Right? This would have been seen as normal and right and good. And the church now is looking back and lamenting that, and rightfully so. I think the church will look back to 2022 and rightly lament much of the sexual ethic we have in here today. I'm not just talking about this church, the church globally, but maybe in here. Right? Do we have a right view of, of marriage and sex and the things that God has prescribed for us? Right? One man, one woman for one life. Or do we have some kind of broken view of marriage that one day the church will lament? So like we lament this type of behavior, may the church always lament when they have ignored God's sexual ethics. So that's what happens here. Right? Sin 
ensue, and sin happens, and so chaos and brokenness is going to ensue. So, again, look at the spiral. Go back to verse 4. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Here's already some brokenness ensuing, right? Like, here's that, here's that look. I don't, I don't know how to give that look. But like, hmm, right that. I'm better than you. Look at me. I got pregnant, and you didn't. Right? So all of a sudden, there's this contempt. There's already spouse battles. Not a good idea. Uh, this, this was not a great idea at all. And this is just a small taste of the brokenness that would ensue. Look what happens, verse 5. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. Right? And you may think, wait, wait, Sarai, didn't you? Wasn't the idea your idea? Right? It was Sarai's idea. Abram went along with it, though. He was called to be the man and to lead, and he should have said no a long time ago uh, to this idea. And yet he abdicated his responsibility to lead. Right? You see the brokenness there? And you see the heartache happening on Sarah's part, the heartache happening on Abram's part, the heartache happening on Hagar's part. May the wrong be done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. And look at Abram again, being very offhanded, not a good model of a husband, of a leader, none of those things. Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai, in her sin, dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Look at the brokenness. I want to talk about that a moment. But this is all that sin will lead to. Sin leads to brokenness. And it doesn't just affect us. right? You see how the sin of one person affected at least three here. It's going to affect the fourth. It's going to affect the child. And then skip down with me to verse 12. We're going to, we're going to go back up to verse 7 and look at that. But skip with me down to verse 12. This is the angel of the Lord talking to Hagar in the wilderness. We'll get to this part in a moment. But I just want to point out this. Look at the description of Ishmael. This would be the name of the baby that Hagar would give birth to. Verse 12 says this. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. How would you, how would you like that to be the description? You're, saying, You're going to have a wild donkey of a man. His hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. Right? In other words, he's going to be stubborn, like a donkey, and everyone's going to be against him. And war and chaos is going to ensue. And through Ishmael's descendants came many of Israel's enemies. And war has ensued and still has. You see the corporate effects of that, of one small, quote-unquote, small sexual sin, right? So, so if we think, if we're ever tempted to think, oh, my sin's not hurting anyone, it's only hurting me. If I sleep with that person outside of marriage, it's not hurting anyone. It's just between me and that person. If I look at pornography, it's not hurting anyone. It's only me. If I do this, if I do this, whatever kind of sin we want to plug into that place, it's only affecting me, and that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Sin has corporate effects, and it has. Sin has had corporate effects on our country. Sin has had corporate effects on us globally as a church. Sin, obviously, here would have corporate effects that would affect millions of people. And because of this one sin, millions of people have died. You realize that, right? Between the war, all the war that has happened in the Middle East, happened because of Abram and Sarai and Hagar's sin. Sin has a corporate effect, and the idea that our individual decisions affect us only individually is not biblical at all. It always has corporate effects. It always is going to affect others. It did that. We see that in in the life of Israel. We see that in the life of the church. We are not as autonomous as we think we are. Sin has corporate effects, and this sinful decision would affect millions of people throughout history, and this is what sin does. It brings brokenness and heartache. Your sin will affect those around you. My, my sister, uh, she's my half-sister, she just uh, had a, a little sister on her dad's side. We have different fathers, uh, and, and her father and stepmom just had uh, a baby that is now um, relapsing due to drugs. Right? The mother took 
heroin and all kinds of other drugs while the baby was in the womb, and the baby is affected by that. And that baby will have issues for the rest of her life because of the, the decisions of parents. Right, you see, you see how that brokenness affects people. Your sin affects others. It, it, we have to begin to get that. It affects us negatively, and it's just going to spiral down. If we continue to live in it and we continue to walk in it, it'll only lead to more brokenness. I mean, look at this. Abram is absent. Sarai is cruel. Hagar is boastful. Right? You see the spiraling down, the brokenness. Here, the whole thing is just a mess. And, and listen, this is, and this, is, so this is the negative aspect. Remember, I told you there's going to be a negative aspect to this and a positive aspect. Don't shortcut God's plan for your life. This is what sin always does. Sin says the very same lie from Genesis chapter 3. You can be God. God knows if you eat of that fruit, you will become like him. And that's the lie. That's the lie of every single sin. You are God. You're your own autonomous being. You can do whatever you want. You get to tell yourself what is right. No such thing as authority. That is, a lie, again, a lie straight from the pit of hell that will affect you and everyone else. Sin has very real and very wide-reaching consequences. And it's important that we grasp that, and that happens here. Yet, God is still merciful. That's why I want us to see that, right? We don't ever want to end on that because the Bible doesn't end on that. Sin has wide-reaching, wide-ranging, very corporate effects. And yet, God is still merciful. Let's continue on. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. This is Hagar, by the way, right? She's fled. She's fled away now. And now, look who comes here. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. Uh, First thing I want to point out here, we've talked about this before, but the angel of the Lord, whenever we see that phrase in the Old Testament, we have to pause and, and see what that angel is actually saying. Because oftentimes, that angel isn't only an angel. And this is where it gets confusing. This is kind of this word imagery that uh, the, the Hebrews would use in their writings because we automatically think, okay, that's an angel. That's a created being separate. But oftentimes we see a, what are called Christophanies here, right? That's just a fancy word for saying appearing of, Christ's in, of Christ in the Old Testament, right? Because we realize Jesus wasn't like born on Christmas Day 2,000 years ago and that's his beginning, right? He's always been right, from the Godhead, three in one, right, God, Jesus, uh, God the Son, that's Jesus, he's always been, and so oftentimes we see these things called Christophanies, which are actually appearings of Jesus, and the Old Testament authors often use the phrase angel of the Lord to, to describe that, and this, I believe, is most likely a Christophany, because look at what is said in verse 10, one of the proofs, I believe, for this is what is said in verse 10, look at verse 10 with me, and I know we're going to We're kind of skipping around. We're going to come back up. Verse 10, the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. That angel is talking in the first person, I. Angels can't do that, by the way. Angels don't create. Angels don't make. They are created beings. This, I believe, is Jesus in the Old Testament appearing. The angel of the Lord, right? The, 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 The phrase that's described known as a Christophany. We see that. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that uh, with Joshua, who appears. We see that with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, and the one stands in the fire with them, right? We see that throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is very real and very present with his people throughout history. That's important that we get that. I believe this without a shadow of a doubt. This is Jesus appearing to Hagar, the angel of the Lord. Back to verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. I found her by a spring of water. This, again, there's, a, there's so much imagery. I wish we could go into all this. This is why I'm encouraging you to come back tonight at 6, and we can talk more about this at, at Bible study. But, but the spring of water, I mean, water is just a foundational thing in the Bible, right? Again, Hebrew people, Jewish culture, Eastern culture, use a lot more word imagery than we do in, in our storytelling. Water in the Bible is a sign of life. We see this throughout, uh, throughout Scripture, that water is a symbol of life. And think about, like, some of the parallels here. Like, think about the parallel with Jesus, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus finds this broken, hurting woman at the well, 
in John chapter 4. Here in Genesis 16, who we believe is Jesus, Jesus finds a broken, hurting woman by this well coming as this life giver. Right? This was this life giving moment for Hagar. And this is because this is what water is meant to do. It's meant to be a giver of life. And Jesus would be that giver of life, right? The living water. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. So if this is true, that this was a Christophany, this is Jesus, the life giver, showing up at a moment when Hagar needed this life. Because God saw the brokenness and the shame of Hagar and met her there in her time of need. Go back to verse 7. Let's read that again. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel also said to her, I, here's the verse we read earlier, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. And here's the verse we read earlier. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all kinsmen. So even in the midst of this brokenness, even in the midst of this chaos, God is so merciful. Do like you, you see that? I mean, God is saying, name, her Ishmael, name him Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. God's saying that. Like, I've heard your affliction. I've heard your cry. I've heard your shouts for mercy. And so you're going to name your son Ishmael, and look at verse 13. So she called on the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. The biblical name that she gives God there is El Roy. You are a God of seeing. He sees. God saw this brokenness and the shame that Hagar had and met her there in this time of need. I love the way one commentator, A.W. Pink, describes this. <clears throat> this parallel in our own lives. He says, it is not amid the gaieties or the luxuries of the world that Christ is to be found. It is not while the soul is enjoying the, quote, pleasures of sin for a season that the Savior, that the Savior is met with. It is in the wilderness, that is, it is as we withdraw from the attractions of earth and are in that state of soul which answers to the wilderness that the Lord meets with the sinner. And where is it that the needy one finds the Savior? Where but by the fountain of water type of the written word. In other words, God often comes to us when we are at our lowest, completely broken with no place to go. Because that, that's where sin is going to lead us. Right? And many of us, I think, are, are coming into this new year with that brokenness. Right? Can, can we be honest with that here in a moment? And, like, take off our, our religious masks and just be honest with one another. Like, we're pretty broken people. I've had many conversations over the last year with many of you, and I've had many conversations with myself in front of a mirror, right? I'm not crazy. Just, you know, anyway, uh, like we're broken people. We're hurting. We're being pushed to the brink of society, and that's okay. We have to cope with that. We have to deal with that. But as followers of Jesus, we're going to be ostracized. We're going to be pushed to the brink of society. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be hated more and more as time goes on. And what we have to deal with now is, yes, that's okay, but two, one, and two, what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with that time, with that moment that God has given us? Are we going to be led to sin that will lead to more brokenness and more spiraling down? Or are we going to look to the God who sees us and rescues us and loves us even when we're completely broken? Maybe it's sin. I don't know. Everyone in here or online. Maybe it was sin this last year that led to your brokenness. Maybe you're just feeling like the weight of the world is on you because sin and the condemnation that follows that sin has, has followed you. Hagar was probably feeling the weight of that at this moment. She knew her wrong. She knew how she looked at contempt, at her servant with contempt. She needed a savior, a redeemer. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus comes to the well. He meets us at this fountain of life kind of moment, these life-giving moments. When we are often at our lowest, often the most broken to give us life. And God sees. 
He works. He knows your brokenness. Whatever, whatever it was. Maybe you had a good year. I don't know. But, but we all come to this kind of moment where we are broken and empty. Can, can we all admit that? Like, let's, let's admit we've been at that low moment. Where it just feels like the weight of the world is on our shoulder. Again, maybe it's from outside circumstances that you have no control over. Maybe it's from your own sin that has led to that. Maybe your own sin has affected. Maybe the corporate effects of sin uh, you've experienced firsthand. Maybe it's someone else's sin that has affected you. What are we going to do with that moment? Or do we look to the God who sees us? I mean, look at the names that are here. Ishmael. And by the way, this is God initiating that. That's important to remember. Hagar realized that despite her sin, God saw her and showed great mercy. And this was all God's initiative. I want to make sure we remember that, right? I prayed that earlier. Like the gospel is God intervening in time and space with mankind, not vice versa. You and I do not choose Jesus. We do not automatically look to him. It has to be God intervening in this moment. We did not say, hey, I need to be saved. I, I'm i going to save myself. Jesus rescues us. He looks at us. He saves us. This is why Hagar said, you see me, God. I love the way one commentator says this. He says, Hagar realized that all her knowledge of God depended on his initiative in knowing her. You ever thought about that? Like, God didn't have to know us. Or, sorry, sorry. God didn't have to give us knowledge of him. He didn't have to give us his word. He didn't have to give us the gift of the church. He didn't have to die on the cross for us. But he did. Because he desires for us to know about him. The initiative is his, and the only reason we have a relationship with the Lord is because he looked down on our helpless estate and came down to rescue us. And he sees it. Again, look at the names here. Ishmael in verse 11, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. In verse 13 again, she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing, El Roy, which means the God who sees me or a God of seeing. For she said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. And even the name of the well, look at verse 14. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It, it lies between Kadesh and bread. Uh, bread. Bir Lahai Roy means well of the living one who sees me. Look at that. Well of the living one who sees me. She realized God was real. God was living, and he sees. Maybe that's your struggle at this moment. Maybe you don't believe God is real or living. Maybe you believe he doesn't see. He doesn't know. He doesn't care, but he does. The Bible is proof of that. The church is proof of that. And most importantly, the cross is proof of, proof of that. And Jesus saw our helpless estate, and he came down off of the mountain to rescue us and to redeem us and to bring us to himself. And even in the midst of this brokenness, look at verse 15, Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. That's where we will end today. Even amidst that brokenness, God still intervened and showed great mercy. I want us to know that. Like Those are the two things I think we leave here seeing from this passage. Sin has very real consequences. We can't deny that. right? God, in other words, God didn't just turn a blind eye to sin and yeah, sin's not that bad. I still love you guys. Hey, right? That's, that's, that's not the God of the Bible. God sees our sin, our brokenness. He's heartbroken over the sin and the brokenness that has ensued from there. And sin may have very real consequences on this earth that are irreversible. This would be an irreversible consequence that would affect millions of people. And yet, in that moment, God saw and God showed great. And God still uses even our poor choices, our sin, our rebellion for his glory. And in spite of our sin and shame, Jesus knows and sees our pain. And he invites us to come and drink living water that we would never be thirsty again. Go with me to John chapter 4. And this is where we will end here today. And we'll take communion together. John chapter 4. This is that passage I described earlier. I would encourage you at a later time today to maybe read through this whole passage and just the loving kindness, the patience that Jesus shows towards the Samaritan woman. 
Look at these words he says in verse 13 and 14. John 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. He's talking about the, the physical water that was in the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus brings this life, this water, which is a symbol of life. He fills us up so that we are never thirsty again. I'm not talking about physical thirst. You're going to leave here and go probably drink a uh, sip of water, and you'll be thirsty after that. You're going to drink this communion cup and be thirsty after that. But Jesus refreshes our souls so that our souls are no longer thirsty for anything else for fulfillment. That, that's what sin and brokenness and guilt leads to. We're thirsting. We're longing for something. We're looking for something to fill this up so that we can fill fulfilled, so that we can sense some kind of uh, identity. Only Jesus can fulfill that. That's what he did on the cross. Let's take our communion cups and bread together. Again, as, as I mentioned earlier, the cross is a symbol, or is a, rather, is a proof of this kind of love. What Jesus would do, the, the cross is proof that God sees you. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever would believe in him should not perish and have, but have eternal life. Right? For the son didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. Jesus sees us. He's this El Roy, this God of seeing. He's the living one who sees you. He sees your brokenness. And he came into the world to invade our brokenness, to invade the darkness, and to give us the hope of new life, to bring to us the spring of water that would well up to eternal life. And that's what we are remembering in communion. And this is for believers, those who have followed Jesus who have followed the way of Jesus, who have saw the goodness and the love and the mercy of God, his intervening, sees that he's a God saying, if you're broken today, maybe it's, again, maybe it's sin, maybe it's some kind of outside circumstance that you didn't have any control over, look to Jesus. Let this be a moment that just washes over you. Let this be a sweet time where we remember what Christ has done, his body broken for us, his blood spilt for us. Let's take it together. And Jesus says, this is the blood of my covenant which is poured out for many. Let's drink together. Jesus, thank you that you saw our brokenness. You saw the darkness. You saw our need for rescue. Like you saw Hagar at the well, and you came down. And even in her brokenness and her sin, and Abram's brokenness and his sin, and Sarah's brokenness and her sin, you saw and you showed mercy. And though the sin would have very real consequences that would affect millions of people, you're still so willing to show mercy and grace and kindness towards us. Lord, I. I pray that we would be a people who truly look to your mercy and your goodness and your kindness and your grace. We would truly realize that you are El Roy, the God who sees. You're the God who knows. You're the God who loves us. And we know the cross is proof of that. As you sent your son to die in our place. Jesus says, you conquered the grave. And you're alive forevermore, seated at the right hand of the Father. I pray that we would be a people in the midst of our brokenness and chaos that would look to you, would trust in you, and let your living water, trust your living water, to refresh us, to wash over us. That we would never thirst for anything ever again. Jesus, help us to look to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I hope you see that. I hope you see that he sees and he's good to you. If you're feeling just broken and like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, please, hey, I would invite you. Come talk to me. I want to point you to the one who sees you, who knows you, the one who loved Hagar thousands of years ago, 
and still loves you today. So feel free to talk to me, email me if you're online, email me at pastor at machiasvalley.org. I'd love to have a conversation with you. And keep looking to Christ. He's good and he's sweet, he's gentle, and he's lowly in this season. Remember, we're not trusting in ourselves and our righteousness and what we can do, but rather in the God who sees and his mercy that he showed at the cross. Andrew's going to pray us out. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're the God who sees and you're the God who hears and help us to be comforted um, by that in 2022. And we're so thankful for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.